Hey everybody, thanks for coming. This is your chapter 16 uh, lecture notes. Um, chapter 16 is about the molecular basis of inheritance. <clears throat> and our goal here is to connect the dots between what Mendel studied and the molecule underlying those principles, which is of course DNA. Um, we'll start with a brief history of how DNA was uh, basically discovered and how it was uh, first learned about. And like most things in science, the understanding we have now of DNA has basically been a relay race, uh, starting with very, very basic understanding of what the molecule is, just identifying it, all the way to understanding the structure and then how the structure actually functions uh, as the transforming principle. So I want to review a couple of key experiments that were able to um, connect these dots and create this story. Uh, the first was done by Frederick Griffith in 1928. This is not the first experiment, but this is one of the first key uh, developments. Um, this investigation allowed the scientific community to understand that there was a transforming principle. Um, there was something that you could use to transform living things uh, when combined with other living things. You could transfer stuff in between them. So here's the basic setup. Um, they took a live strain of pathogenic bacteria. Pathogenic meaning it's going to cause uh, mice to die. Um, they took a live non-pathic strain of bacteria, and this was their control. The pathogenic strain caused mice to die. Um, if you infected them with the non-pathogenic strain, the mice were fine. Um, they took uh, these pathogenic bacteria and they heated them up uh, and killed them. Uh, with heat. So they're called heat-killed pathogenic bacteria. Um, these heat-killed pathogenic bacteria were injected into the mice and the mice lived. Now, the key understanding was when they mixed heat-killed pathogenic bacteria and non-pathogenic bacteria together. Once they did this, suddenly these non-pathogenic bacteria took on pathogenic qualities and caused the mice to die. So this demonstrated that there was such thing as a transforming principle and that you could take traits in certain organisms and somehow transplant them into the uh, into another organism they just didn't know how um now this is a uh this is a pretty big deal and so people ran with this idea um avery mccarty mcleod built upon this and they purified DNA itself. Um, and they also purified proteins from pathogenic bacteria. And then they started injecting these things into um, the other non-pathogenic bacteria. And what they figured out was that only the DNA caused transformation in the bacteria. If you injected proteins from the pathogenic bacteria um, into the non-pathogenic bacteria, nothing happened. It wasn't the proteins that were causing um, the change, but the DNA did. This is the first experimental evidence that said DNA was the actual genetic material. Now, this is back in 1944, so quite a long time ago. Now. Uh, other people, once DNA became um, known as the transforming principle, other people started working on this. And um, one of the key understandings was this base pairing rules um, of DNA, uh, A's and T's and C's and G's, which we'll get into when we talk about uh, transcription and translation in the next unit. Um, Erwin Shargoff was the one who developed the idea that these things were in equal quantities and that they paired together a key development in the structure of DNA. Um, there were uh, 
other experiments done to confirm that DNA was the transforming uh, material. Um, there are viruses called bacteriophages, and these bacteriophages will infect bacteria. They're basically uh, viruses that target bacteria. They have this very strange structure. They look almost like an alien spaceship or a spider or something weird. Um, now, uh, these guys named Hershey and Chase did something called the Blender Experiment, which is a famous experiment that helped to identify um, DNA as, or kind of confirm that DNA was the transforming principle these bacteriophages were using to infect uh, bacteria. So um, it's called a blender experiment because they literally used a blender to separate out um, different particles in this slurry. So what they did was they radio uh, actively labeled bacteriophages. Now, bacteriophages are viruses, and viruses are made up of protein coats, which is this outside part. All of this stuff around here is made out of protein. And then the genetic material is right inside there. So they basically have two components, proteins and DNA. So in the first uh, treatment, they radioactively tagged the protein um, of the bacteriophage. And they allowed the bacteriophages to uh, infect bacteria. They used a blender to separate the bacteriophage protein shells from the bacteria themselves, keeping the bacteria still intact. And then they uh, centrifuged the mixture. So they took whatever came out of the blender, put it in a device that spins it really fast and separates it based on weight. Once this was separated based on weight, they had protein, which was lighter, and bacteria in the bottom, which was heavier. And they repeated the same process, but in this treatment, they actually radioactively tagged the DNA. And the radioactively tagged DNA, um, they basically followed the same process. And then they got to the end, they looked at what was in the test tube that had been centrifuged. And they basically looked for where the radioactivity occurred. So when they radioactively tagged DNA, the radioactively tagged molecules ended up in the bacteria pellet. So at the very bottom, we have bacteria in the tip of the test tube. And when they radioactively tagged the DNA, that's where all this stuff ended up. Um, when they radioactively tagged the proteins, it never made it into the bacteria. So the radioactive molecules stayed up top and didn't get into the, pro into the uh, bacteria themselves. So this was further confirmation that the DNA um, was being transferred from the bacteriophages into the bacteria. The protein was not being uh, transferred. Now there were a group of scientists that um, worked on really isolating the structure, understanding that there was this double helix model of the DNA. Uh, prior to this, there were lots of different hypotheses about how this could be structured. Um, and uh, these two gentlemen, um, and uh, Rosalind Franklin, um, I wouldn't say they worked together, but they definitely worked on the same idea at the same time. Um, the story of Rosalind Frank Franklin's pretty, uh, pretty sad. She was an x-ray crystallographer, which means she shot x-ray uh, lasers at molecules and then looked at the imagery that it created. Um, this is a very dangerous process. You're dealing with radioactive, uh, I'm sorry, you're dealing with um, x-ray, which is a known cancer causer now. Back then they didn't know this. Uh, Rosalind Franklin died uh, right after she took her famous x-ray crystallography picture of um, DNA. And she died because of her work. Uh, she didn't get much credit for it until much later. Anyways, this group of people uh, were contributing, all contributing to the development of the structure of DNA. So we now know that DNA is a double helix. We, all, we now know that DNA has a code built into it and it has base pairs that it follows.
So how <clears throat> does DNA actually function and do one of its most important jobs? One of DNA's most important jobs is to create copies of itself. Um, this is done through a process called replication. And replication is something that we need to understand completely for this class. So we start with a single strand of DNA, what we, we will call the parent strand. It splits out into its two component strands. And those two component strands are then rebuilt with individual uh, nucleotides. Um, that's in this light blue color here. These individual nucleotides come in and fill in to form basically two strands from one strand. Uh, this is diagram shows it in another way. Um, basically, the original strands work as template strands. Um, and Watson and Crick, when they figured out how the structure was done, they made this very famous understatement that's down here in the quotation marks. They said, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. They're like, yeah, I guess this makes sense because you could just replicate it really easily. Uh, very big understatement. What they figured out was a huge development. Now, there were lots of different models for how this could be done in the DNA. There were three different models that kind of gained the most traction. Um, there was the conservative model, which meant that there was one DNA strand and it was replicated completely um, to build a brand new strand. Um, the original strand would always be intact. The new strand would be um, built completely out of these spare nucleotides. There's also this, what would be called the semi-conservative. Now, notice here, conservative means that the original strand is conserved. And even as you go through multiple generations of replication, you can still find the original conserved strand. Now, the other option was semi-conservative. This is another model that was very um, popular. Um, the uh, molecule would split into two, and it would be um, replicated uh, directly across the base pairs. That would mean that in the first replication, there was still pieces of the parent strand in both of the strands. And then in the um, second replication, uh, there were still some place where you could find original parts of the strand. There, those original parts of the strand were still conserved. And then lastly, there was this idea of dispersive. And dispersive was kind of like a random movement of um, DNA sections uh, that would kind of distribute the code evenly throughout. Um, in order to figure this out, uh, there were a couple of experiments done. Um, again, they used the idea of labeling with uh, radioactive uh, elements. And so um, this was actually used with what's called heavy nitrogen, which is nitrogen 15. And um, basically all the new nucleotides that were uh, built uh, were labeled with a different isotope. So we had nitrogen 15 being used and we had nitrogen 14 being used. Um, and they basically tracked the uh, parent strand through the heavy nitrogen. Um, they allowed uh, a certain strain of bacteria to replicate um, and they basically tracked where this heavy nitrogen went. So um, the first round of replication, we see the parent uh, DNA here and then the new strands here. Um, if it was a conservative approach, you'd basically see two different types of DNA, one containing the heavy nitrogen and one containing the light nitrogen. If it was a semi-conservative, um, you would see a mix of the two. Um, and this is in the first round of replication. The problem is that you would not be able to tell the difference between the uh, semi-conservative and the dispersive model in this case, because in both cases, the heavy nitrogen and light nitrogen would be mixed equally together. Now, the second round of replication um, 
is where we start to see the difference. Um, as we start to mix together the parents, the parent strand and the uh, new strand, um, we end up getting an equal mix. And then we uh, mix that yet again with um, a lighter strand. And this would actually give us two different outcomes here um, in the dispersive model, or from the dispersive model to the, to the semi-conservative model. Now, they actually did this through uh, blotting. Um, and so this was the data that they actually got out of this. Uh, long story short, what they figured out was that the semi-conservative approach or semi-conservative model was actually correct. Now, this double helix structure is, um, like I said, key to the understanding of how the DNA actually works. Not only is it structured in a way that it is stable, uh, it can be opened up along specific sections. Uh, it's also structured in a way that makes it easily replicated. Um, the details here get a little bit confusing, but basically what we need to know is that there are two different strands in the DNA, and they are what are called anti-parallel. So we have a five prime end, and this is all based on the carbons in the sugar phosphate backbone. So this right here is a sugar called deoxyribose. And this sugar uh, has an end of it that has what we would call the five prime carbon, which is way over here. And you'll notice that on one strand, the five primes are all pointing one, a specific direction. And then on the other strand, the five prime carbons are all pointing the opposite direction. And the strands are anti-parallel. So whatever pattern you have going from five prime to three prime over here, you will have the same pattern going from five prime to three prime over here. So A, C, G, T on the other strand is a, C, G, T. So this means that the DNA molecule actually has direction and <clears throat> the complementary strand runs in the opposite direction. Now there's a lot implied here by the bonding in the DNA molecule. What's most important to realize is that we have a covalent bond called a phosphodiester bond. And this phosphodiester bond binds between a phosphate and the uh, deoxyribose sugar. This phosphodiester bond, this covalent bond, is a very strong bond. The bonds down the middle are hydrogen bonds. This means that if you start pulling on this molecule to open it up um, or to separate things, the hydrogen bonds down the middle are what is going to break first. So we have strong bonds and weak bonds. And because of that, we can break open this molecule at a very specific spot. Um, they break open right down along the middle along these hydrogen bonds. Now the base pairing in DNA is a combination of purines and pyrimidines. And hopefully you remember some of this from our unit way back um, at the beginning of the year, our biochem unit. Um, we learned that there were different types of nitrogenous bases. And these nitrogenous bases um, connect together um, along hydrogen bonds in a very specific way. We always have purines um, binding with pyrimidines because they can only make, some of these can only make certain kinds of bonds. So um, in this case, our purine, adenine, makes two bonds. Thymine is the only other base in DNA that can make two bonds. Uh, guanine and cytosine, they're able to make three bonds. So there's not a possibility for an error where G accidentally binds with T or C accidentally binds with A. It's just not possible based on the pairing. So um, when DNA replication happens, base pairing is followed, the, splint, the strands split um, right along the hydrogen bonds down the middle of the molecule, and 
three nucleotides floating around in the cytoplasm right around where this is happening uh, start getting added in and building new strands. Now, this is done with a large team of enzymes and coordinated replication at multiple replication sites in the molecule. Um, this little diagram here is really important to uh, internalize. So make sure you guys spend some time looking at this and understand what sh what's going on here. This is what it would look like in an actual DNA molecule. This is a, um, I'm sure this is like a scanning microscope image. But basically, these bubbles, here's a bubble here. There's another bubble down here. And there's another bubble here. These are our replication sites, just like what we see over here. And those are going to spread out until we eventually have two separate, what are called daughter DNA molecules. So um, this replication process involves some steps. The first step is that we have to unwind the DNA. Um, the enzyme used here, remember this is all chemical reactions. It's facilitated by enzymes. The enzyme used here is called helicase. It unwinds part of the DNA um, and it's stabilized by these like single stranded binding proteins. So these proteins bind first and help to hold the replication site open, allowing helicase to go through and break those hydrogen bonds down the middle. Um, the second step is to build the daughter strand by adding complementary bases. Um, these bases are floating around in the cell ready to be used. And because this is a chemical reaction, um, we're going to need energy. And uh, it turns out these um, molecules bring with them their own energy source. Now, this is the part where people always kind of start to get a little bit frazzled. Um, you've heard of ATP. We've been talking about it, I don't know, in some capacity all year. But it's important to realize that each of these nitrogenous bases and each of these nucleotides can actually be their own energy source. So we have ATP, but there's also GTP and TTP and CTP. So Basically, what we have here is a bunch of phosphate groups bound to these nucleotides to form something called a nucleoside, which has three phosphates. And as they arrive, they've got this extra energy for bonding. So if you knock off one of these phosphate groups, you release energy. If you knock off another one, you release more energy. And then you have your sugar phosphate for your sugar phosphate backbone. And you have your nitrogenous base. And at this point, when they only have one phosphate left, they are now called a nucleotide. Now, um, the enzyme involved here is called DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 3 is what helps to facilitate the building of the new molecule. Um, we are only able to add nucleotides in a specific direction. So this is what our, is called our reading strand over here, our template strand. And on this side, uh, the complementary strand is being constructed and all of these uh, nucleotides are being added to the three prime end. So here's the three prime carbon, um, and all these nucleotides are going to continue to add this direction. So where all this is occurring is called the replication fork. And so right here we see an example of the replication fork, and there is a leading strand, a strand that is just replicating in one direction building on the three prime ends of those nucleotides and it's nice and smooth in the construction process um, unfortunately on the other side you basically have this molecule becoming exposed um, and it's running in the wrong direction so see if you can follow me here notice we build five prime to three prime this direction, which means the DNA is always read three prime to five prime. On the other side, here's the three prime side, and here's the five prime side. And so this molecule on the other side is actually being read in the opposite direction. And this causes problems in the replication process. It's not a smooth, easy process on the other strand. Um, this is called the lagging strand, and it is a very 
largely coordinated process to get this thing built and seamless on the other side. It's built basically in little sections. And these little sections are called Okazaki fragments because they were discovered by a gentleman with the last name of Okazaki. Um, it involves multiple enzymes uh, to coordinate all of this. You don't need to know all of the enzymes involved, but just understand why this process happens in such a clunky way on the other side. Now, these DNA polymerase molecules that are building uh, DNA are um, extremely fast. Um, DNA polymerase 3 can add 50 to 500 bases per second. And this is the main DNA builder molecule. Now, DNA polymerase 1 is working um, in chorus with DNA polymerase 3. Um, it is a much slower molecule, still adding 20 bases per second. And it's basically going along and editing and repairing things that are um, basically mistakes from DNA polymerase 3, which is moving much faster. Um, DNA polymerase 1 will also help to remove the primer. So if you look back here, DNA polymerase 3 is the one that's able to move along the leading strand uh, seamlessly. On the other side, we have DNA polymerase 3 moving in specific sections. Here's a polymerase 3. This is also polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 1 is going to kind of go along after the DNA polymerase 1 and just kind of make sure that everything's okay. Remove the primers, um, link everything together, fill in any missing sections. Now, um, this whole process does result in errors. And um, it's important to realize that these errors have to be repaired um, and fixed in a quickly, in a timely manner. Um, because originally, when we uh, first have our DNA replicated, um, there is an error in one out of 10,000 bases replicated. Um, with the editing and proofreading process, we can get that down to one, an error in one in one million bases. Um, again, DNA polymerase one is the one that does this. Um, it's going to proofread and correct errors, repair mismatched bases, and removes abnormal bases that aren't supposed to be there, or if they're, um, you know, a section that is not connecting right. Like I said, this whole process is extremely fast and accurate. Um, it takes an E. coli bacteria, which has 5 million base pairs um, in one chromosome, less than an hour to copy that. Um, human cells, we have 6 billion bases, and we can do that. We can replicate that in a few hours. Um, there's only about 30 errors per cycle. What this really looks like, is shown here on the left. Um, this is a kind of a difficult diagram to, to see. So this is a cleaned up version of it. But basically we see all these little replication bubbles and on each side they have a replication fork. Last thing you guys need to know for this chapter is how we take DNA and turn it into a chromosome. Um, DNA structure, this double helix is important but it's really important to realize what's going on with storage of DNA. And so while DNA strands um, are holding all the information, we have histones, which are proteins that DNA are binding to, and they're forming these little nucleosomes, these little um, beads on a string. And this is a way of storing the DNA. And those uh, nucleosomes bind together to form a larger strand called chromatin. Um, chromatin is what is uh, visible when you look at cells that are um, starting to kind of condense their DNA. Uh, those really thin fibers are chromatin fibers. Um, chromatin is then looped up and 
bound back together, oftentimes with methylate, methylene, um, or, or a process called methylation, um, which helps these this chromatin to stick together um, and condense. And then these condensed chromatin loops then start to um, form larger loops, and eventually they will form this chromosome structure. So this diagram is going to be really important for you guys to uh, internalize and understand um, how we go from DNA to chromosome is a key understanding from this chapter. All right, that's pretty much it. There are some review questions on this if you'd like to go over them. Um, hopefully this was helpful. Please bring your questions to class. Thanks for watching.